We are here, my friends. Welcome tonight, 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time on August 19th. I am streaming at you, testing out OBS Studios because I want to make sure that we're getting the best quality type of stream when we do these uh, broadcasts. So I hope everybody can see me okay. And I figured, why not talk about cables? Because I know it's late at night. But I know that if we talk about cables, all of you night owls will come onto this channel and you'll want to be joining into the discussion. So we'll keep it light. We'll try to keep it fun. Um, I hope everybody sees us okay. So the question I'd like to pose to you guys, and just in general, I always think about it because I spent, you know, almost two decades debunking myths in the audio industry, mostly around cables. And it got, it has me thinking, it's like, do these exotic cable vendors actually believe in their own claims? Um, do they do it because they actually believe in what they're saying? Or are they being mischievous? Are they being dishonest? Or are they being genuine and either they know some truth that the rest of the audio world or the, or the rest of the engineering world doesn't know about or hasn't figured out about wire? Or do they just repeat what they've heard? And does it sound like a good story to them? Because I'd like to think, in general, I would like to think that people are inherently good. I don't, I don't like to think that the masses of people are bad and that they want to be deceptive and they want to be snake oil salesmen and they want to take your money and dupe you. But I am also a little bit of a pessimist. I'm a pragmatist, if you will. And I always question people's claims and their validity and the limitations of their science because a lot of so-called science that you read about isn't really science. And we're living in an era now where truth has become a marketable commodity. And people really, um, a lot of people just reject science. So they go by feeling, they go by the gut. And I think a lot of it has to do in cables with perception and um, placebo effect confirmation bias i think all of these things factor in and it makes for a good story for a lot of these exotic cable vendors and the problem with that is when you're dealing with a piece of wire that there's very little differences to discern measurably with you're left with how are you going to differentiate your product from someone else's product you're going to have to do it with a story and that story has to be a good story and you have to gather people to this story and you have to create first of all a problem what's the problem that we're trying to solve it's a problem that's not an engineering it's not in an engineering textbook because we know how cable transmission works it's a very well understood phenomenon since electricity was invented but somehow these audio companies know something engineers don't know they know something nasa doesn't know and it just makes you wonder why is this really limited to the consumer audio marketplace but you don't see this as much in pro audio and you don't see it in any other engineering profession i mean i spent years doing rf design you know microwave frequencies and we you know we design patch antennas dipole antennas all that stuff requires very high precision type of design you have to be really careful about noise immunity you have to be careful about characteristic impedances all the stuff that matters because you're dealing with very small wavelengths. But at audio frequencies, you're dealing with very large wavelengths. And transmission line effects really don't affect audio frequencies. But these cable vendors make it sound like it does. And then they invent their own terms like strand jumping, where the cable is going to have electricity jump from one conductor to the other. And they have to solve that either by using solid core wire or by using their little battery powered scheme. So I want to share with you some stuff, um, some articles that we've written in the past and I want to talk about more of this and, and why we think that these cable vendors continue to espouse this information on us. But I wanted to look at some of the uh, comments here real quick. Hey Gene, you got in touch with insomnia. You should plug some headphones on and go down and play your drums and tire yourself out. Yeah, you know, I am a light, I'm a, I'm a night owl pretty much and I work late and I'm really trying to get this streaming thing down packed because I'd like to have guests on board with us and I'd like to be streaming, you know, three or four times a week at the very minimum. 
Serious question, what do you do when you go into the speaker store and you say, what really make a difference on these cables that just walk out because they obviously can't discuss the topic? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. When you go into a, a hi-fi shop and they're, telling, and they're trying to sell you cables as being the biggest proponent that can change the sound quality in your system, you need to leave that place because they just don't have their heads or their hearts in the right place. So let me see if I could share my screen here. Um, that other program I was using was a lot easier than this one, but hopefully this works okay. So you should be able to see my screen right now. And let me just uh, check the feed here to, to make sure. I know there's a little bit of a delay. Someone says, I do believe certain cables can make a difference, but not $10,000 cables. Well, all cables make a difference. It's the question is whether or not, first of all, that it's measurable. And secondly, if it's audible, because just because you can measure something doesn't mean it's audible. So he does have fun with this topic when asked. Yes, I do. I do enjoy uh, talking about this topic. Okay, so it looks like the screen share is working. So we do have a whole section of our site dedicated to cable theory. And if you go to AV Research and you, and you hit on AV Cables, we have all this stuff. So I spent years just going over all the different um, cable theories from all these different exotic vendors and just either validating their claims or debunking their claims. Just want to make sure you see me. Okay. So one of them is cable lengths. And I've seen YouTubers basically say, oh my God, I can't have my speaker cables at different lengths. I just can't do it. I don't know if it makes a difference. I don't want the signal to arrive faster at one speaker than the other. And that's just complete nonsense. That is not something you need to worry about. Transmission line effects do not affect audio frequencies. You need to have very, very long cables, hundreds and hundreds of feet for that to really matter. And by the time you get to those lengths, you're dealing with too much insertion loss from the resistance. Because what really matters most with speaker cables is resistance. Now, I have this whole article here. I even have Hugo uh, on a video that we talked about this. So this topic was already covered, but I think it is a good idea just to show you that we have this in case you guys want to check it out. So cable length differences do not really matter. What matters with, with speaker cables is resistance. And I have an article that talks about the resistance of cables because you're dealing with low impedances with loudspeakers plugging into an amplifier. And that's where you don't want to have a lot of resistance because it acts like a voltage divider and you'll drop power across the cable as opposed to dropping all the power across the speaker. So we have like um, a little table here and this is very conservative. I mean, this is basically telling you how long the speaker cable is versus the gauge and how much loss you could expect. This is like the recommended cable distances versus gauge. So if you're running your cables are 10 feet lengths, you could run 18 gauge. I just, why bother with 18 gauge cable when you could buy 12 gauge cable from Monoprice or Parts Express for like $50 for a spool of it. I just say go with 12 or 10 gauge if you could do it. If you can't do 10 gauge because it's too thick, I like using 14.4 because what that does is that gives you four conductors. And by having four conductors, you have redundancy if you're running it through drywall in case one of the cable pairs break. And if you don't need both pairs, you could parallel them together. And then your effective gauge goes down to 11 gauge, which is close to the resistance of a 10 gauge cable. So that's really a cool thing. And that's there. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is I'll, I keep hearing this stuff about cables causing distortion. And AudioQuest, AudioQuest is a, is a company I like to pick on often because their, their stuff is just so nonsensical. But I did notice recently, since I've gone back on their website, most of their white papers are gone. Most of the crap about the strand jumping that I've been debunking for years just magically disappeared. And they're hanging everything on this dielectric biasing system where they put a battery on their cable and it makes no physical connection to the conductors, but it supposedly energizes the actual uh, dielectric itself. So I just find this interesting because Again, if this really mattered, if we really needed to energize our dielectric, why aren't we? Why isn't NASA doing this with their cables? Why aren't we doing this in the space program? Why are we only doing this in audio? The audio is the, simply the easiest uh, signal to transmit out of any signal type of electrical signal you can do. So it just 
it, it really is, it's clever on their part that they could actually sell a battery on a cable and people buy it. But they talk a lot about how there's this distortion that they're trying to fix, this nonlinear distortion. But they don't really show any proof of this nonlinear distortions. Nothing at all. And we've actually went and we measured cables and we have, you know, tons of articles on it. In fact, one of the um, best Class D amplifier designers in the industry, a gentleman named Bruno Putzi, he's worked for Hypex, which makes a really nice uh, Class D amp. He went and he took all these various cables and, and part of an article for us, and he tried to measure distortion, nonlinear distortion. And as you could see, it doesn't matter what cable you measure. There's no distortion. A cable, a, a piece of wire cannot cause a nonlinear distortion. If a company is telling you they're fixing distortion in their cables, they're either lying to you or they just don't know any better and they've been regurgitating nonsense. And one thing that I've learned over the years is when I've interviewed some of these speaker cable companies or the exotic cable companies, most of them don't have degreed engineers that work for them. It's just a marketing company and they go and buy cable from OEM suppliers like Belden and then they wrap a fancy jacket around the cable and then they have storytellers write stories. So they don't actually have degreed engineers. They don't have test equipment like we have. Like for example, I have the Wayne Kerr 6420 magnetic analyzer. That's an $11,000 analyzer. And I will show you that real quick, just so you guys understand. So bear with me when the cable, we're gonna do a little JJ Abrams style camera shaking here. And I wanna show you. So here we are. It's been a while since I turned this on. But this is overkill for what we do, but I have it anyways. And this device will measure your AC measurements and your DC measurements. And this is where you measure your resistance, inductance, and capacitance of the cable. And from this, I could actually model the cable. I could put these results into MathCAD. I could put them into P-SPICE, which is a uh, electrical simulating software. And I could actually model the kind of losses you're gonna get from a cable. There's no unknown science when it comes to speaker cables. Nothing can be unknown about wire. I'm sorry to say it. I'm, you know, I'm sure there's some exotic cable vendors here that are watching this and they're probably cringing, saying, oh, but we know better. We, you know, we have all of this audio testing where people tell us they hear differences. And we have a boom box demo. And we could show you that our cables sound better using a boom box. Wow, can you imagine for years they kept, People would always say, oh, I can't hear differences in cables because my speakers aren't revealing enough. My electronics aren't revealing enough. My room is not revealing enough. But wait a minute, AudioQuest has a boom box demo. They could show you the difference, the benefits of their cables using a boom box. And let me show you that, my friends. We have an article on their boom box demo. I hope I still have it. Here it is. AudioQuest Cable Boombox Demo, Legit Science or Slick Marketing. I do encourage you to read this article. I will put a link to it in our discussion here. Let me put it down here. Paste. Boom. So what we are seeing with this article and what we're seeing in this test is it's another form of psychology. When you condition people about what they're going to hear before they hear it, and then they ask after the test, hey, did you guys hear the difference in, in these cables? And if just one person says they hear a difference, then other people are going to raise their hand and say, yeah, I heard a difference too. And then if they, the people that don't raise their hand are going to say, well, maybe my ears aren't good enough. You know, maybe I just didn't know enough about audio. So there's a whole phenomenon, a whole psychological phenomenon. It's called Ashcott. I don't even know how to say that word. Ash's conform conformity. I recommend that you guys watch this YouTube video that we have linked up here. But this is an example of slick marketing, my friends. This is slick marketing. And I hate to say at this point that, you know, a company like AudioQuest doesn't know any better because they do know better and they should strive for better than this nonsense because this is bullshit and I this is a big pet peeve of mine when I see companies do this and then what makes it worse is when you get the press 
who just regurgitates what manufacturers say. And most of the press are not degree engineers. They're just people that are writing about their audio hobby. So they hear from the manufacturer what they're supposed to expect, the differences they're supposed to hear, and they just write it in a review like it's fact. And then that just gets thrown all over the internet. So this is what's called fake news, my friends. Fake news when it has pseudoscience mixed in with subjective impressions that really can't be confirmed. Because as you notice, most listening tests for cables are never done in a real scientifically controlled manner. They're not done in a blind test, a single blind test or a double blind test. I'd be happy with a single blind test, but you never see single blind test cable tests done. You just don't. So I want to go back now and look at the chats. And I hope I'm not preaching too much, but I, um, you know, I just think it's a good question to, t to talk about, a good topic to discuss. Serious question, what do you do when you have to go into a speaker store and they say, oh, okay, I already read that one. Let's go back down here. There's a lot of questions here. I wish I could share these comments. It's not like the other program I was using. What do you think of the silver and HDMI cables help or does nothing? Silver, silver has actually has a little bit better conductivity than copper but it's way more expensive to use silver. So the easy solution to that is just to use a little bit more copper and then you have the same DCR, you have the same resistance. So silver cables, really not that big of a benefit, my friends. Let's see. Is it true? I, it's true, I worked at Best Buy for two weeks, one guy in college for a theater and one for a business. I was told to sell as many AudioQuest cables as much as possible. Yeah, and that's, thank you for bringing that up. That's the other thing I notice about uh, when you work for a store like Best Buy or some of these other places, they give incentives to their employees that you have to sell power conditioners, you have to sell cables. They bring in trainers, so-called trainers from these companies, and they precondition the salespeople. So it's not like it's not like the salespeople that come in are, are these guys that are being mischievous and they you know they they're trying to go out and screw you. They're literally being brainwashed. Most of these guys are just coming out of college or just coming out of high school. They don't have a very solid EE background. They don't even know basic electronics or basic electrical theory. So when you get someone in a nice dress, in a nice uh, suit, bringing in these cables, talking all this techno jargon, it sounds legitimate. It's almost like when um, you know when you hear Scientologists come in and they try to give you, they try to test your thetan levels with their little machine. It almost looks legitimate and um, if you hear enough of that and you get conditioned enough of that you start preaching it too so and then you start preaching it with your colleagues and then you start realizing hey this stuff sells man there's good profit margin in cables so and I'm not telling you that cables don't make a difference I I don't understand why people think that just because I'm talking about the nonsense in cables that I don't believe that there are differences in cables. Of course there are differences in cables. I could take a really badly designed cable. I could take, for example, there was a company called Goertz. They're no longer in business, but they used to, use, they used to make flat conductor cables. So they would put one conductor on top of the other, sandwiched together flat. What happens when you put two conductors close together is you lower the inductance, but the capacitance goes way up. And what happens when you have a lot of capacitance on a long run of cable is you can cause an amplifier to oscillate. So they had to put a Zobel network on the other end of that cable. Otherwise, it would cause some amplifiers like in receivers, for example, to oscillate. So, of course, in that situation, that cable will make your speaker sound different or will make your system sound different. It's sort of like a glorified tone control. Or if you use a cable that is very high gauge, let's say you use a 24 gauge cable on your speakers, versus a 10 gauge cable, you're killing a damping factor now because you got so much resistance in that cable that the base, you actually might get more base. It, it will be like a sloppy loose base. So you will hear a difference. But I'm going to tell you this now, and I've said this before, properly engineered cables are sonically indistinguishable. Okay? So if you have a cable that is designed properly, cable A, cable B, they're going to sound identical. They might not measure identical, they might measure close. Whatever I measure on that device that I showed you is thousands of times more precise and more consistent than anything your ears are gonna tell you. So 
you start with the measurements and you make sure that the cable is designed properly and you make sure the cable doesn't have massive amounts of resistance or too much capacitance the inductance is important too but usually you can inductance and capacitance are kind of interrelated with each other it's not hard to make a good speaker cable it's not hard to make a good interconnect you just have to get an interconnect that's properly shielded and a, and the type of interconnect that you use for video frequencies is perfect for audio if you can get a 75 ohm coax cable a double foil braided cable and an 18 gauge for example like a 1694 belden that could be used for 1080p and even higher video depending on what kind of connection system you have and it's perfectly good for that it's perfectly good for audio frequencies to use as a subwoofer cable or as an interconnect to your cd player let me see what else we have here I get random pop and power dips on my wall plug. Any recommendation, budget, power cleaner, conditioner, blocks? Um, well, that's, you know, that's an interesting question. You might get some benefit from getting a UPS backup, but you got to make sure it has enough current capability to plug your amps in. Um, you might want to contact your power company because that sounds like you have a power problem and maybe you even want to run a dedicated line to your audio equipment. I had a really bad example of snake oil and cables in the wire world, the thousand dollar cable, one foot HTML. Yeah, wire world is a company that won't even talk to us. I've never had any interaction with them other than the fact that they read our articles and they don't want to submit us any samples and they don't want to do anything on our site. So, oh, well, they think people that buy a super expensive OLED, they'll pay 200 audio, 200 for an audio quest, six foot HDMI. So crazy. Yeah. And when you're dealing with six foot HDMI cables, almost any cable at such a short length would work. So it's sad when they charge that much. How does the spe how does the speaker sound when you use a power cord cables? Well, I mean, it depends. Most power cord cables are 18 gauge, so it should be okay. I mean, but why would you want to do that? Just get, you know, like I said, get 14, four or get 10, two, just get regular uh, twin feeder cable. I personally like quad cable, the star quad cable, like the Canary Forest 11. Those are awesome cables. They measure really well. We've measured hundreds of cables in our cable review section of the site, and you can see all the measurements there. I love the Canary Forest 11s. I also like Kimber cable. I know their stuff's super expensive, but the Kimber, not the big, not the giant garden hose cables from Kimber, but like the ATC and the APR, those cables are a good balance of inductance, capacitance, and resistance. And I love their compression WBT banana plugs because they make a really solid contact. And that's important too. You gotta make sure you make good contact with your speaker terminals and your amplifier terminals. Otherwise you get more contact resistance. And I've seen that happen with a lot of spade connectors where they just don't make a good lock down with the binding post and they'll slip off real easily or they just don't give enough clamping force. So I do like the compression, uh, expanding compression uh, banana plugs. Coat hangers are the best cables. Yeah, I love that. I believe it's my fridge causing the interference. Every time I compress it, it's, I, yeah, well, that's the problem. If you have the refrigerator plugged into the same circuit as your audio equipment, that's a huge problem because that's a motor that's running on and off. You definitely need to run separate power to your home theater if you can. Audio Quest cable BS is why I won't, I lost a comment, won't consider a dragonfly. I won't support snake oil brands. I'm glad I found blue jeans. Yeah, you know, that's the sad thing about AudioQuest is they do, their, their DACs are awesome. Those little USB DACs, their headphones are kind of a mixed bag. I don't think they have all the science like, like what Harman's doing it, implementing into their headphones. But their little uh, Dragonfly DAC, that's a great product. I mean, they do make good product. If you don't buy the crap with the battery on it, and even if you take the battery off, it's a good product. It's just ridiculous ridiculous the claims they have to do just to sell it to people and they are very expensive and you're better off putting your money towards other aspects of your audio equipment and your room especially your room acoustics for example power conditioners won't regulate your voltage no but you can get power you can get power conditioners that have voltage regulation built in but i would say fix your power line first before you start doing that kind of stuff you always get losses when you try to regulate a line and you have to deal with that. What do you think about Amazon Basics cable? Are they pure copper or CCA or how do they measure? You know, I've never gotten any of those in. I probably should get some in. Yeah, I don't, I'd rather have pure copper than the cop, than the CCA crap. Um, I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of good reviews on the Amazon stuff, so maybe I should get some in and measure it. It's been a while since I've done any cable measurements, to be honest with you. 
How can three meter cable from main speakers have substantially different resistance in normal situations? I mean, I could show you the resistance tables on, on speaker cables. It's all something that can be calculated per foot and you can, you could expand it out. It doesn't make a huge difference. If you're dealing with 10 or 12 gauge cable already, some of the really exotic brands will get you down to eight gauge or even a little bit less, but those are short lengths, so it doesn't really matter. That's why I'm trying to tell you guys, don't go crazy with the cables. Yet, if I do a review on, if I do a review on a receiver versus a review on a cable, I'll get more feedback on the cable review than I will on the receiver review. It's crazy. If I go to put up some old audio equipment, for example, if I sell some old audio equipment, I could put a, a four thousand dollar receiver on the market for two thousand dollars. That's you know a year obsolete, and not get any bites on it if I try to sell it online. But if I go and put an exotic cable online, I could sell that thing in a week. Believe me, I've t I've sold a lot of old exotic cable samples I had, and they sold like nothing. It just blows my it blows my mind how a piece of wire holds more intrinsic value to audiophiles than a solid state of the art piece of electronic equipment. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, once again, wondering your thoughts on an aftermarket power cable and power conditions. Do they work or are they worth the money? With power, with power uh, cables, I say use what the manufacturer shipped with the product. And if for, if for any reason that that broke, then just replace it with a similar gauge and you know whether it's shielded or not. I just go with whatever the manufacturer specs on their amplifier because why would they ship that product with an inferior cable to begin with? The only cable that matters is HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabits per second. Who else is ready for eARC? Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's you got to get a Cat 1 or a Cat 2 ca um, capable HDMI cable when you start getting into these higher resolutions. Gene, hope this is not too far off topic. Do you recommend using well-engineered short coax interconnects as preamp jumpers instead of cheap tin socket jumpers that usually ship with the integrated amps? Um, yeah, I've seen those corrode over time and they, ca they could cause problem. The problem you don't want to do is you don't want to use long um, jumpers because then you introduce the ability of, of noise pickup. So yeah, if you're going to do that, make sure it's a double foil braided coax shield jumper. You know, don't make it like 10 feet long. Make it like, you know, a half a foot or less if you can. Uh, let's see. A really bad example. Yeah, I read that one already. So I think, I think I've covered this pretty well. I'm not trying to say that, that um, these ca a lot of these cable vendors are just, you know, dishonest people. I think they're just not educated properly in electrical theory. And to their credit, that's it's not an easy topic to always understand. You know, electronics is complex, but you shouldn't be writing these bogus white papers without having a background in engineering. It's just it's it's intellectually dishonest, and that's one of the biggest pet peeves I have. I don't mind if a cable is expensive, if it's sold as a piece of audio jewelry and it looks cool, even though most of your cables are going to be behind a rack and you're not going to see it. I I get why people want nice looking cables, but at least try to sell a story that's based on truth. And that's why, you know, you get a company like Blue Jeans Cable, for example, they're not going to sell you nonsense. They're just going to sell you well-engineered cables or even Monoprice is doing it now. And some of the um, audio ca companies are doing it like SVS and Emotiva. They're all selling their own versions of cables too. So I think it's important just to keep things in perspective and keep them honest. You tell them, Gene. I've seen cables, thirty-five thousand dollars each. That must be brilliant. Yeah, we went to the Audio Expona show in in Florida in February, and we were in the Von Schweikert room, and they had seventy thousand dollars speaker cables, and they had them elevated, so you can't put them on the ground because they cause static electricity and then make the signal jump. And this is what the guys were saying in the room, and it's like to me, it just took away from the whole demo experience because their room was beautiful. The speakers sounded great, but then they had to go and throw that nonsense in with the cables. And then I found out that the cable company they're, they're um, promoting in there is actually in partnership with Von Schweikert. So it's like, okay, well, there's definitely a conflict there. I mean, they're, they're trying to promote the cables with the speakers and they're trying to keep them as, a, as all their separate entities when they're really not. 
So it's just, it's weird. You know, I think the cable stuff is always going to be there, but I think people are becoming more aware of it online because we've been hammering it for years and I'm seeing other YouTubers doing it as well. Shauna Techno Dad did an awesome video on, uh, on audio cables. I don't know if you guys saw it a couple of days ago. I'll link it up down here. You got to watch that video, man. It's just really funny. And it just kind of shows you about confirmation bias and how people think that they hear a difference even if there is no difference. The power of the mind is very, very uh, strong and that's why you really do need to have controlled, unbiased type of testing if you really want to see if there's a difference in cables. What happened to Monster Cable? Are they any good? They kind of died out. I mean, there's like nothing left with that brand. I mean, they, it's like they're selling like boom boxes now or something. I don't know what happened to them. I want to use household electrical cables when I couldn't afford hi-fi cables. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. So I think we've covered this topic as much as I'm going to cover it for tonight. It's kind of weird talking to myself. I need someone else to kind of throw back this information with. So I hope that it has you guys thinking about, you know, do these guys really believe in their own claims or are they just being conditioned? And is it just some weird kind of um, biasing that's happening over time? by hearing nonsense being repeated. So I hope that you can pass this message on to other audiophiles and that uh, we could educate people better so they could use their money more wisely. And for the exotic cable vendors that are out there that wanna sell their product, you can do all you want with that, but please try to keep the science out of it if you don't understand it. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this and until next time, keep listening.